uh, we hope that you're getting around in the fog all right this morning. It was a little foggy coming in from Hartsville, John McKay told me this morning. He is here with us. He's back. He's from Australia. He was on the show for, um, oh, a whole hour last time and didn't even touch on a lot of the things that he knows about creation science. And uh, we did a thing last time kind of comparing creation and evolution, and uh, he's going to answer some more questions for us about this Jurassic Park thing today. He's also going to get into the origin of the races. Uh, I think last time we got into living fossils, and uh, it proved to me, at least, that uh, I think evolution is not a very solid theory. And uh, I think he's going to strengthen our creation uh, evidence a little bit more today. He's going to show you some artifacts. This is a man, uh, John McKay, who has been uh, in science for a long time and has chosen the field of creation research and uh, travels all over the world. We'll see some pictures from some of the places that he's been some of the people that he knows, and some of the stories that go all over the world that are very much like what you've heard right here in the United States. He's from Australia. He's a creation researcher, a science degree from the University of Queensland. He's an international speaker, radio, television, public seminars, university schools, etc., etc. You are so busy. Yeah, they do keep me busy, Susan, but it's, it's good fun telling people about the wonderful things that God has made. Well, last time you were here, now we talked about living fossils. We certainly did. The creatures that are, in essence, the same today as they've always been because God produced creatures to make their own kind to remind us that he doesn't change. I mean, it's very interesting that the Bible says that God has stamped his nature on the creation. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the dollar bill and it says in God we trust, you couldn't trust a God who used evolution because if everything kept on changing, he'd keep on changing. But the fact is you can trust the God who created because he made the creatures to produce their own kind. So you can always trust a tomato plant, as you folks say it here, we say tomato. But tomato plant, you can always trust it to be a tomato. So therefore you can always trust God to be God. His rules never change. And the politicians need to hear that. Yes, they do. I hope they're watching this yes, morning. Yes, so do I. <laughs> okay, you've been, uh, you've been in uh, Nashville or in the Tennessee area for how long now? Well, I've been in Nashville and Kentucky and, uh, and, and the regions around for the last few weeks and uh, we've had a tremendous time in the schools, uh, public schools, telling them about the evidence that God created. It's been a real open door and we're grateful for it and uh, the folks out there can pray for us as we tell these kids that their brains didn't evolve by accident but they were made in the image of God. In fact, the biggest image problem you've got in your schools and amongst the young people is they think this, they're the sort of over-intelligent, hairless images of apes. No wonder they've got self-image problems. They need to be reminded that they are the image of the living God. It defaces it maybe by sin, but Jesus came to fix that problem up and recreate them in the image of the God who is the creator. Even if they're not perfect, well, they are in Well, you're image. not perfect, and I'll be honest, I made a mistake. Well, at least one. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe more. <laughs> maybe more. Just in the last 10 minutes, yes. I guess. Well, now, uh, can we prove it? Can we prove creation? Well, it's one of the interesting things in universities that I often get told, you know, look, evolution is scientific and creation is, that's religious. And uh, you, you can only prove things like evolution. And I, I sort of laugh to myself because if you think about everything that everybody does every day, when we make a cake, it's not by chance. It doesn't evolve. You have to intelligently design it. When you invent a car, it never happens by chance. You can leave iron and bolts and nails and rubber around for a million years. It won't turn into a car. The fact is you have to create it. And everything a scientist does is because he creates it. So we know the evidence for creation. Um, when we design television sets, like the monitor over here, somebody who existed before the, the television set, somebody who's not a part of the television set, and somebody who's far smarter than the television set can ever hope to be, actually designed it. They brought it into existence by creation. So the thing that I like to point out to people is, if you examine my hand, mm -hmm. right? We can't make uh, one of these robotic cranes um, as efficient as our hand. You remember a couple of years ago, one of the big car manufacturers had to fire all of their robots because the robots had gone wrong. The electronic circuiting was firing rivets through the windshields. You know, <laughs> um, you know there was a design problem. So they had to recreate the robots. And the fact is, they still haven't made them as efficient as the hand. And one of the simplest points you can ever make 
is if the only way you can copy a hand is to intelligently create it, then the silliest explanation for a hand is chance. If you can only copy a hand by creating it, and you think the hand got here by chance, then there's something wrong with your intelligence system. If the only way you can copy a hand that you think got here by chance is by creating it, there's a simple reason. You had to create the copy because that's how the original got here. Well, what I'm finding out, you know, Thayer Martin is a friend of mine who has been a, such an exponent of the creation theory versus evolution. And uh, what, I'm, what I'm understanding more and more, especially from having talked with you the last time about the living fossils, is that it is so important for us to understand this, this whole creation science thing because it really does give us hard evidence. Well, it's certainly true. I was uh, talking to one pastor and he was a little concerned at what was happening in his school uh, situation. His children went to a public school and uh, he was saying, look, in our school we've got some incredible social problems. We've got an increased drug problem, an increased suicide rate, the kids' self-image is terrible. And uh, he said, we put on more counsellors and it's not working. So I said, do you mind if I talk to your young people? He said, no. And so I asked, it was just at the start of the, the school uh, year, and I said, listen, you're in upper high school, what were your first lessons today? And they said, well, our first lesson was chemistry. I said, well, what did you learn? And they, they said, well, we learnt that man was just five cents worth of chemicals, really, in a different shape package. I said, Dad, did you hear that? I said, what was your next lesson? They said, it was biology. I said, well, what did you learn there? Well, our first lesson was how we all evolved from the slime into people. I said, now, Dad, take particular note. You're worried about these kids' image problem. They think they're a pile of slime worth five cents and their package just a little bit different. No wonder you've got counselling problems. Mm -hmm. If you want to fix the social problems you've got in your school, then it's foundational that you get back to the fact that God made man in his image and man exists for a purpose at the hand of the God who made him. And no other purpose will satisfy. And it really is absolutely foundational. Mm -hmm. You have many tapes out, yes, I know we now. Do. And probably, I guess the latest one is The Origin of the Races. Isn't yes, it? it's, um, it's a documentary. Uh, over many years, we've been collecting the information from all the races that the biblical history of man is true. We all come from Adam, and we've all come from Noah, and we've all come from the Tower of Babel, whether we're black or we're white or we're yellow or red. The fact is, all the evidence from around the world, and you're going to see it on this documentary, points back exactly to what the Bible has to say. Okay, before we get into the first clip from this Origin of the Races, uh, the missing link. Now, evolution would tell us that somewhere, and they're going to find it one day, maybe the missing link, this, this thing that we came from the primordial slime and all of a sudden had intelligence, but there must be some point at which this all changed. Whatever happened to the missing link? Well, I guess there's a couple of ways I can answer that question, Susan. Here's the sort of creature you find right at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, the lowest fossil-bearing rocks in the Grand Canyon. And the problem for the evolutionist is you can pull out the eyes of this creature and look through them today. It's called a trilobite. See, one, two, three lobes in it. And uh, you can pull out the eyes of these creatures. They're so well-preserved you can look through them. And they've got complex double lenses, a-planar lenses, to cope with the sort of light problems that comes in water. If we were to design an underwater camera that functioned this way, we would have to use exactly the same lenses. Now, if you were trying to explain how this creature evolved, you would have to say, well, there's a missing link. There's no evidence that ever came from anything below because, well, virtually, let's face it, there's no fossils in the rocks below in the bottom of the Grand Canyon. These are supposed to be the oldest fossil-bearing rocks in the bottom of the Grand Canyon. So everything's missing below it. Now, the same is true for every major group of creatures, whether it be trilobites or tree frogs or people. Now, if you, um, your viewers out there have National Geographic, mm -hmm. the one thing that convinced me that evolution is not true is the missing links like this. I added it all up. I was an evolutionist for many years, and I, I was really into fossils. But the more I studied fossils, the more links there weren't there. In fact, the whole chain was missing. When you have a look at the uh, National Geographic from March last year, you want to grab a copy, Susan, because on page 24, that's on the left-hand side in the second paragraph, it's right in there, hidden away. You'd never see it normally. And here's what it says. The whole 50 pages is about the evolution of man. 
you know how we were once hairy ape-like creatures and we lost our hair and grew bigger brains and turned into people and in the second paragraph there it says a hundred years of paleontological research or digging up fossils has failed to find the bones from the critical period now there's two questions we need to ask why was that on page 24 and not on page one well the answer is simple national geographic knows that you're like me and everybody else after page three we only read the pictures you don't you miss the key bits yeah. the fact is it should have been on page one and here's what it should have said we've been looking for the fossil evidence that man evolved for a hundred years and we still haven't found it the next 49 pages is pure fantasy but of course no one would read the article <laughs> at all and that's the facts there are no missing links um there, 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 there never was man the first fossil people and there's tens of thousands of fossil people are bigger and stronger and better than us the oldest ones and we've devolved if we've done anything all right the origin of the races has to do with uh, the fact as i believe and i believe you believe uh, that that people all came from adam yes the evidence is beyond a shadow of a doubt and uh, as i've said the fact folk don't take my word for it listen to what all the races around the world have to say in their traditional stories okay well let's listen to what some of them have to say in this first clip In 1497, the English king, Henry VII, dispatched two brothers, John and Sebastian Cabot, to explore Columbus's new world. It was here they would meet their first Red Indians, red because they covered their faces with clay to protect themselves from insects. But the red clay had much more significance to the uh, Mi'kmaq Indians of Cape Breton, where the Cabot brothers landed. They told the story of the great creator, Niskam, who took the red earth and breathed into it and formed the first male, Glooscap. Glooscap is a name that means good. And the Indians attribute so many of the geological features, the islands and the bays, to Glooscap. And even the Europeans have turned him into something of a tourist attraction. By 1604, when the French traders had first arrived, there wasn't one native Mi'kmaq who believed that man had evolved from the animals. The Indians had brought their creation stories with them when they'd first moved up here from the southwest. And their other stories give a hint as to where they'd come from before that. By 1636, the French governor of a handful of Europeans, Nicholas Dennis, had made it a matter of record that the native Mi'kmaqs already seemed to know about Noah's flood and the Old Testament law. He caused to be born one man and one woman, and they multiplied and lived a very long time. But that have become wicked along with their children who killed one another. The sun swept with grief ever at the rain fell from the heaven in such great abundance that the water amounted over to the summit of the rock and of the highest and most lofty mountain. In 1677, the French scholar Leclerc was intrigued by the native description of the bear constellation. It was the same as the European. And European constellations can be traced back through Rome to ancient Greece and through ancient Greece back to one place, Babylon. Some have suggested that the Mi'kmaqs got their constellation stories from wandering Vikings, visiting Basque fishermen, or even from itinerant Irish monks who were here many centuries before Columbus. But what makes that unlikely is the Mi'kmaq story of the Milky Way being the pathway of the spirit, so similar to what some of the Australian Aborigines say, and they never visited here. When the sun set, the first Australians sat around campfires, looked up to the dark sky and told tales, some sacred, others for fun. One story dance concerns seven girls who asked tribal elders to test them the same way as boys, so the young ladies would know how to bring up strong sons. The girls were given trial after trial, which the elders were sure they would fail. But the girls proved as strong and fearless as the men. They passed the last ordeal so well, the great spirit made them stars in the sky. They are still there today. Aboriginals call the stars seven sisters. Astronomers call the constellation Pleiades.
The surprising thing is that the ancient Greeks who built once quiet temples like this told exactly the same stories. The seven daughters of Atlas and Pleione, who for their virtue and piety, were placed in the sky as example to all young maidens. You can still see them today if you look up into the night sky, they're, they're called the Pleiades. Chance invention of the same stories is ruled out by the fact that at the opposite end of the globe, the North American uh, Huron Indians tell an identical tale. Uh, such star stories dispel the doubt that common legends are due to missionary activity promoting the biblical story of creation and the flood. After all, the Pleiades story is just not in the Bible. So why do Australian Aborigines, North American Indians and ancient Greeks have the same stories about the same stars? After all, Aborigines and Indians Greeks are all different colours. Perhaps they were the same colour once and lived in the same place. That was here in Nashville, wasn't it? That's exactly right. Yes. A little bit of Greece in the middle of town. That's right. That's right. We've got a lot of Greek architecture <laughs> around here and a lot of Greek thinking, I think, That's too. Right. Where, where are you going to be next? Well, if town? folks enjoyed that, Susan, we'll be going behind the scenes of all of that research and showing them an awful lot more in the next couple of days. We have uh, programs in Franklin, which isn't all that far away from here. Mm -hmm. So we'll be at Faith Lutheran in Franklin Road, Franklin, on Monday and Tuesday evenings that's tonight and tomorrow night at 7 p.m okay. that's the 6th and the 7th of december so that's 7 p.m on the 6th and 7th of december at faith lutheran in franklin road franklin and if they've enjoyed that and want to hear a lot more of the evidence because you can see there's important points there if you want to reach out to all the races of the world you must be sure that they all come from one man adam Therefore, they've all got the same problem, sin. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you and I and the black people and the white people and the yellow people all need the same Saviour, Christ. Yeah. So then come along and join us at Franklin Road, Franklin at the Faith Lutheran. We'll be having a great time. I guess we should tell them about the prize too, shouldn't we? I think we should tell them. Um, this if, is it. Yeah, this if they watch a, carefully today, we're going to ask a question probably in about 15 minutes. And if they get it right, they can win a free copy of this uh, video, The Origin of the Races. All right. Now, this is a $35 video. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's a terrible thing that the world and the governments of the world uh, finance all of the theories and all of the scientific research to prove evolution, but people like John McKay are not financed as well. And uh, so these things are real important, but you can win one of these. $35, Origin of the Races. We'll show a little bit more of the Origin of the Races here in a few minutes. Let's, um, you're going to be this weekend in Owensboro. I know. Uh, right? This weekend I'll actually be back in town. I'm up in Kentucky uh, during the rest of the week, but I'll be back in Gallatin this weekend. Um, right. We'll probably be talking about dinosaurs and Jurassic Park and things like that. Okay. All right. Now, we're going to wait to give away this. We're going to wait to give away question. that, yes, in about right. 15 minutes. I just laid this down next to some kind of a creature that uh, the Lord no doubt made, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe you can explain what some of these are here. Sure. Can do that? Um... That's a very interesting creature, Susan, because it's actually an elasmosaurus. I've got a, an elasmosaurus bone here in my pocket. These are mighty handy, these Australian vests. You can carry so much in them. <laughs> makes it fun going through customs sometimes when they find out you've got dinosaur bones in your pocket, but never mind. Um, this was, I guess, amongst the first of the big sauruses that were dug up. Uh, original one discovered here in the USA. I found one in New Zealand. We had a good year last year, dug up a few dinosaurs in creation research. Mm -hmm. But it's quite a funny one too because it was discovered to have 76 bones in its neck. And the fellow who discovered it, well, he saw the, the teeth at this end and he saw the short little bones it at this end. Short, and he, he couldn't believe that any creature could actually have its brains that far ahead of the rest of itself. So he, he put the, t the head at the end. And of course, that's made quite a funny tale for geologists because it was 100% wrong. And it just shows that it's so hard to figure out what some of these creatures were if you don't have a picture of what they used to be like. It's just like a jigsaw puzzle without something to copy it from. Mm -hmm. But uh, all these famous sauruses are now in, of course. You better play with the one the kids love with, Susan, oh, yes. the, the old Tyrannosaurus yes. Rex. T-Rex. Uh, T-Rex, that's right. Came to be known, yes, yeah. in Jurassic Park. Did you watch Park? Jurassic Park? I did. Well, the question I like to ask people is, I wonder how many dinosaurs there were in Jehovah's Park. Because it's <laughs> God's world. You see, in six days he made the heavens and the earth, and part of that was a great idea called Jehovah's Park, the Garden of Eden. And you never read of Adam and Eve running through Jehovah's Park saying, Help! I'm being chased by a savage Tyrannosaurus Rex. Because the it's fact is... It's just not there, is it? Well, the fact is, 
Tyrannosaurus Rex was like all the other creatures. If you read Genesis chapter 1, God told all the animals that they would eat plants. The world that God made was a good world. Tyrannosaurus Rex was a cabbage killer. Um, it wasn't until sin came into the world that animals became savage. It's sad, but the fact is we're to blame for many of the animals that became these savage killers in the end. And of course, when people have a look at the dinosaurs, again, take them along to Jurassic Park, mums and dads. Um, it's a little bit gory, but point out the one line that slipped in there, and I'm sure the Holy Spirit had a good giggle when this line appeared in the script. Here it is. It's my favourite line out of the movie. It says this, Creation requires a supreme act of will. It's in there. No wonder Jesus said we'd be judged by the words out of our own mouth because right in the middle of that movie, which is all about evolution, is that little line, creation requires a supreme act of will. And if you think about it, the movie's fabulous because of the robot dinosaurs. But how did the robot dinosaurs get here? They all got created. Yeah. Not one of them got here by chance. In fact, they cost millions and millions of dollars. Yeah. And if the only way you can make a copy of dinosaurs that Steven Spielberg thinks evolved by chance is for him to create them, then you've just shot evolution in the foot. You've That's proved right. that dinosaurs were created. Okay, we have about 30 seconds till we go to a break. We've had several people call, evidently, mm -hmm. wanting to know where you're going to be in Gallatin again. Okay, fine. I'll repeat it. Um, on Monday the 6th and the 7th of December at 7 p.m. Tonight will be tomorrow. That's tonight and tomorrow, yes. We'll be in Faith Lutheran Church in Franklin Road, Franklin. And we'll leave a copy of this with the channel so that if folks miss it on this, they can, they can ring up a little later. Right. And on the weekend, we'll be back at Gallatin Church of Christ. That's all day Sunday from 9.30 through till midnight, if necessary. <laughs> uh, we've got three programs there. That's in Gallatin itself. So that's Gallatin Church of Christ in Gallatin. And we really will be talking all about the monsters that God made, the dinosaurs, uh, on that weekend program. Okay, so T-Rexes did not really eat people. They ate cabbage and Not initially. Things. They were just giant cabbage killers like the lions and tigers. Remember the verse in the Bible that says, In the new heavens, the new earth, even the lion will lay down with the lamb and they'll both eat grass? Yes. That's what it used to be like when the world was good before sin came in. Sadly, sin has affected us and all the other creatures and animals who were once good became killers sad history of the world. All oh, right, so we've only evolved in our thinking and not... Devolved in, is, the, devolved, devolved yes, is the word I like to use. We're going to go to a break. This is such fascinating stuff. Don't... All right, uh, my guest is John McKay from Australia, creation researcher. And you have some books you wanted to talk about. Yes, um, Susan, just have a, a look at that one there. It's by a, a geologist, a Christian geologist. It's called Unlocking the Mysteries of Creation. And he's got a talent that most geologists don't have. You just open it up so the folks can see it. He uses little words and lots of pictures, whereas most geologists use words about as big as <laughs> the American oh, continent, wow. and almost no pictures at all. And there's a great section there on dinosaurs. And mums and dads, the kids these days are so hooked on dinosaurs that they, they get into evolution ever so quickly without even realizing it, and the whole foundations of their confidence in Genesis is removed. They think God made dinosaurs as savage killers. What sort of a God would call that world good where animals killed each other just for the heck of it? Well, the fact is they need to get the facts about the faith and the truth about dinosaurs right from day one. So if they want a great section on dinosaurs, it really is tremendous. Yes. And they can write to our address, which we'll put up on the screen, and uh, we give away a free tape and literature and all sorts of information about these wonderful creatures that God made. So right. if they want more information, look for that book, The Mysteries of Creation, or write to our address, which will come up on the screen uh, over there in Hartsville, and we'll fill you in on all the information you need about dinosaurs and all the wonderful things God has done. Okay, this is called the Unlocking the Mysteries of Creation. It's by Dennis R. Peterson. And it says Volume 1, so there must be more. Well, we're hoping that he gets around to Volume 2. He hasn't yet. I'll okay. keep on to him about that. <laughs> all right, all right. You had uh, a few more fossils here or some things oh, that you wanted to Oh, we have some very interesting things. I love these. You love these things. You yes. told me that before, didn't I do. you? I do. By the way, Susan, um, do you know what sex that seahorse is? Are you uh, any good at telling whether it's a boy or a girl? I, I don't think I know where to look. You don't on think a you know where to look. I'll tell you what, I'll give you the, the secret. Boy seahorses always have a zip. Can you see the zip on that seahorse? Yes. It's there, isn't it? It's very interesting. Um, in fact, I'm sure God invented these creatures because he knew one day man would come up with this idea called evolution 
and that the evolutionists would really get stuck on things like seahorses. I mean, if you think about a normal a fish, how do fishes normally swim like that, don't they, horizontally? And they move their tail. Well, a seahorse is the only one that swims vertically, and it uses the fin on its back. No other fish does that. Um, in, the, in, the, in the fishes, the female lays the eggs and looks after them if, if they get looked after at all. The interesting thing about the seahorse is the girl puts the eggs inside the male. That's why he's got the zip and the eggs are laid inside the male and he fertilizes them and in fact the, uh, the male then gets pregnant. The female, the male seahorses are just like the ancient Egyptians, you know, the daddy is the mummy and they're, they're, they're just, they're incredibly well designed to reverse everything. And of course the evolutionist scratches his head and wonders how on earth these things could ever evolve from ordinary fishes. Well you and I know that they didn't. Any of the fossils of seahorses and that show that seahorses and all the other creatures have always produced their own kind. Seahorses have always been seahorses. They're not related to other fishes that swim in different ways because God made a world full of variety and yet each creature produces its own kind to remind us that he is the same and he can be trusted yesterday, today and forever. He is always the same kind of God. All right, I want to go back to some of this uh, origin of the races mm -hmm. tape because there are so many people around the world that tell the same story of the flood. There certainly are. There yeah, certainly yeah. are. And it, it's so imperative in modern evangelism because what it means is that little black pygmy in the middle of Africa his ancestors left the Tower of Babel with the full knowledge of the story of the flood so they can't claim any excuse. So mm -hmm. it's imperative the Christians mm -hmm. get out there and tell people the whole of the gospel because there's no hope without that. All right, let's go to John McKay on tape with the origin of the races. Present day tourists visit this temple enclosure at Honaunau on the big island of Hawaii for pleasure. But when Captain Cook landed here in January 1779, any native who had offended Hawaiian royalty or religion fled here to avoid the death penalty. And in those days, even letting your shadow fall on the Hawaiian king's belongings could have cost you your life. The guilty who made it behind this wall could find safety in this place of refuge. There was a way out back into normal society, but only one way, if the priest of the temple would make absolution on behalf of the offender. Step outside this refuge gateway without that, and the penalty of your sin would be death. Not only did the old Hawaiian kingdom have such places of refuge, so did the ancient Israelites. In fact, the relationship so impressed the first Christian missionaries to this island that they called these places by their biblical names, cities of refuge, even though there never was a city here. Such similar ideas are a big pointer to the common origin of what is usually regarded as separate races of mankind, and more than a little hint that such separation occurred far more recently than most people think. When the Spanish left Mexico to explore the Grand Canyon in the early 1500s, the Native American Havasupai Indians had already been there around 500 years. The canyon walls, which fenced in their summer gardens, are covered with Havasupai artwork and their home has become a famed tourist attraction. But the Havasupai view about how the Grand Canyon formed is far different from what most students learn at school. The Havasupai say, before there were people on earth, there was a good God and an evil God. The good God had a daughter who he wanted to become the mother of all living. The evil God was determined to stop this, so he covered the world with a great flood. The good God hollowed out a big tree and placed his daughter in it and when the waters flooded the earth, she was safe. Finally, the flood waters went down, the mountain peaks emerged and the canyon was formed. The hollow log came to rest on the new earth and the good God's daughter stepped out onto an empty world. The ancestors of the Hopi Indians began to move into these canyons several thousand years ago from Asia. They brought with them the same flood stories. They also carried these, throwing sticks or boomerangs. They used them to hunt things, just like the ancient Egyptians. People in India, the first inhabitants of Poland and the Middle East. And the most famous of all was the Australian Aboriginal boomerang. It was the world's first environmentally friendly weapon. You couldn't throw it away because it kept coming back. Each group bought the boomerang from where man originated. 
But where in Asia was that? And if we all once lived together, then how come we look so different? And why do we speak more than 3,000 different languages? Now that's a boomerang. Now that's a boomerang. <laughs> yes, it's, it was we, fun doing that. We lost a few over the edge. You did? <laughs> we did, yes, as we were practicing. <laughs> Take 20. Just had okay. to get the time right, and they lost the wind in the, in the middle there. Okay, all right. Origin of the races. We're going to show a little bit more of that here later in the show. Uh, you can win one of these, and uh, all by answering a question. Yes, and the question is, where does the Bible say that that boat that all the world's people's ancestors were on, Noah's boat, where did it land? What does the Bible say about where Noah's ark landed? That's the question. They have to get it right. They have to get it right. They have to get okay. it right. Okay, so they're gonna, are we going to give them any uh, anywhere to look for the answer? Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, they should know it already. It's easy to find. Okay. Uh, where does the Bible say that the ark of Noah actually landed? All right. The first caller to tell us what the Bible says about where Noah's ark landed uh, will win this $35 video of the origin of the races. And um, this would be wonderful to give to your school or your church. We actually and, designed uh, it for public television and for school use. We've got quite a few videos that we've designed to go into the secular classroom um, so that they, you know, I was in one of the big schools last week and our subject to the whole of the high school assembly was the evolution of mankind. That was one of their subjects in the textbook. And I sort of laughed at this and I, I, I um, you know, had a little giggle. I said, do you know where the word mankind comes from? And they looked at me and uh, I said, well, look, you really shouldn't be talking about the evolution of mankind if you don't know what the word means. Um, if you trace it back through history, you find in India, there's an ancient story about a flood with a man called Manu, M-A-N-U. And he's the man who survived in a big box when the world was flooded by water. And most people don't realize that the English language and the Indian language all come from the same place, the ancient Sanskrit. Um, and so if you go through the Roman records, you'll find that the Romans wrote down that the ancestor of all the Germanic and the Celtic peoples, the Europeans, was a person called Manus. And so when the missionaries were in England and they were writing down what males and females were, they found out that the Europeans and the English and the Celts and the Irish and Scots, etc., were all the descendants of Manus. Now, the old way of writing this was the kin of Manus, which missionaries shortened and turned around into a word called mankind. So any science class that talks about the evolution of mankind, mankind actually means, well, M-A is short for Mr., N is Noah, kind is the descendants of. It's almost humorous, isn't it? But again, can you see the importance of the scripture, Susan, where Jesus said you'll be judged by the words out of your own mouth? The topic is the evolution of mankind, which really means evolution to unfold out of man, Mr. Noah, kind the descendants thereof. So you can't avoid it. The, the textbooks themselves just open the door wide open to bringing back Noah and the ark and the story. It's in the very words we use. So we had a great time with all six or seven hundred kids at the high school. And, uh, you know, it's just there. It's the facts. Now, I know somebody named Mick Manus, and I know Mick, is like, isn't that like son of? Yeah, that's Gaelic. Um, you know, my name is McKay, so if you trace back my ancestry for 600 years, we're the sons of Kay. So Mick Manus would so be? So Mick Manus means the sons, sons of, of Mr. Noah. Noah, really, because Manus is Mr. Noah. Mr. So Noah. the Scottish clan Mac Manus are the sons of Mr. Noah. It's just in our words. Oh, my goodness, my goodness. That's going to make them feel good. All right. <laughs> this, is, this is a fossil fish, and uh, some kind of a fish, and it says that it's 60 million years old. Can we believe that? Well, um, 60 million years old or less, I or like less. to put it. In <laughs> fact, I, I, I was in a university um, a few weeks back, and one of the students came and said, how could you believe the world was made in just six days? We've got these rocks, you know, that are millions of years old. And he referred to that exact formation. And so I whipped this out of my pocket and said, isn't that interesting? I've got one of those rocks too. Now let me show you what's in it. There's a fish. Now, if you can hold it up, Susan, so the folks can actually see the fish. I don't know whether they can get a close up of that. It's a bit All reflective. Right. Let, let me but see. But we can just yeah. see how well they go on that. Oh, let's put it yeah, on yeah, this try one. that one. You can see it's a beautifully preserved fish. The whole fish is there. The tail, the mouth is open, the fins, etc. And this rock was supposed to form slowly. In fact, I Beautiful. picked this one up in a tourist shop because of what it says on the back. 
it says millions of years ago these fish lived and they died and they fell to the bottom and they slowly got covered up and over a vast period of time they turned into fossils. So as I said to the university student after I heard that, I said, fiddle faddle. I said, dead fish float. You can't get a beautifully preserved fish on the bottom and if the viewers don't believe me, watch an underwater television program and count the number of dead fish on the bottom of the sea waiting to be slowly covered up by mud. You can do it on the fingers of your left foot, Susan. They're just not there because once they do get to the bottom, you know what they look like? You've had an aquarium? The dead ones swell up and they rise to the top and then they go all fungusy and green and they blow up and they fall to the bottom and they're, they're just eaten. There's nothing left. So the only way you could produce that rock with fossil fish beautifully preserved in it is to bury them like that, so yes. that they're just pickled fish. Mm -hmm. And those rocks there, I've collected lots of them, I've got rocks from that deposit with fish this long in it. And I've seen some with fishes that had other fishes in their mouths. They were buried before like they had happened, time to spit lunch really out. Suddenly. It happened so fast the fishes didn't have time to blink. What would have had to happen? Well, something incredibly catastrophic something that happened rapidly on a big scale. In fact, you can go to that, that area where those rocks came from and you can find about six billion fish per square mile. Mm -hmm. Now, if you can imagine, it wasn't just the little fish here that got zonked out, it was billions and billions and billions and billions, something devastatingly mm -hmm. catastrophic. And the point I like to make out of it is if you've got rocks from the bottom of the Grand Canyon with fossils like this in it right to the top, then those rocks couldn't have taken millions of years because they wouldn't have these things in them. They would have rotted before they got buried. Right. So the fact is, the rocks don't talk about millions of years. The people do. The rocks cry out the praises of God, who's a brilliant creator, because we can't make copies of this by chance. You have to redesign the optical lenses for cameras using intelligent creativity. So the rocks cry out the praises of God, the creator, and not the, the, the applause of millions of years of chance evolution. Okay, let's show some more of the origin of the races. And by the way, that number is 7540039 if you have not called in about the videotape. And wait a minute, I think we have, we already have one. Okay, uh, Jay Robinson of Mount Juliet. Very good, Jane. Congratulations. The, You'll enjoy the question. The, yeah. And it's on great. the mountains. The answer was on the mountains of Ararat, not on Mount Ararat, as most people say. Okay, the Bible now what is never the difference? says that the ark landed on Mount Ararat. Uh, if you read Genesis chapter 8 and verse 4, it says that the ark landed on the mountains of Ararat, and there's many of those. Right? The Mount Ararat is just the tallest one, and that's where local tradition says it is. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, it's not what the Bible says, and we need to always make sure we know what the Bible says versus what popular opinion says. Yes, we've had Ron Wyatt on the show here who uh, discovered what they believe is the mm -hmm. ark on, on the mountains mm. of Ararat. And uh, I think I didn't know until I watched those pictures that there are several, yes. many, many mountains, right. uh, many sides to the mountains. Now, let's go to a little more of this because I think this tells some more stories uh, from around the world about the flood. They claim that North American indigenous stories of the flood and creation with the result of mission adding biblical colour to traditional Indian tales is easy to prove wrong. Hunters and explorers, such as David Thompson, who penetrated far into Canada long before missionaries arrived, collected this record from Western Cree natives. After the Creator made all the animals and had made all the first people, he said to his Sagachan, Take good care of my people and teach them how to live. Do not let the people or animals quarrel with each other. But Wasagachak did not obey the Creator. The Creator warned Wasagachak, I will take everything away from you if you do not obey. But Wasagachak did not obey and tricked the animals and people. So they fought, and the ground became red with blood. So the Creator sent a great flood and washed the ground clean. The sea came upon the land, and everything was drowned except one otter, one beaver, and one muskrat. In my 40 years with the Crees as a teacher, as a priest, as a counselor, I've heard stories about the creation and about the flood that were similar to the story in the Bible. And these stories came from the elders in every area.
There's another story that both Ojibwes and Crees across Canada are quite interested in, and that's a story that's very much like Jonah. It's about a man who uh, asked a fish to swallow him, and, and the, the fish did swallow him. And later on, the fish comes to land, and uh, his sister is wondering where he is. She goes down to the shore, and she hears someone speaking out of this, the belly of this fish, asking her to, to cut the fish open and let him out. And uh, people relate this, relate to this story as being very much the same as Jonah. They say, this is Jonah. The Dakota people always speak of one creator, and, and especially this uh, holy, holy motion fellowship. The members, they speak of this creator as, uh, as the Wakantanka. Or, or a great spirit, or it has a name, and they call it the Ajuhoa. Ajuhoa means creative voice being. So when a missionary came to this country uh, with the gospel and, and, the, and the, the God of the gospel called Jehovah, which is, which is very close, King Kalakau, the last native ruler of the Hawaiian Kingdom, introduced the ukulele to the music world and defied Christian missionaries by reintroducing the sexually provocative hula dance. In 1887, he compiled a book listing traditions which existed in Hawaii prior to the coming of the Europeans and also recorded one of his questions. How did the Hawaiian priesthood become possessed of the story of the Hebrew Genesis? When Captain Cook's boats dropped anchors in Hawaii, Genesis was already well known to them. The king stated it was probably well known when the Hawaiians found their present home in the 6th century and when his ancestors left the coast of Asia 400 years earlier. Mount Mor All right, my goodness. This is so... It's all there, isn't it? Your tapes are so wonderful. And, and when I was able to go down and actually hear you talk and you were showing slides, your presentations are marvelous. And well, if folks really enjoyed what they, they heard, then we'll be talking about the local evidence from Tennessee here and yes. what the uh, traditions were here down at Franklin Road, uh, Faith Lutheran in Franklin Road, Franklin. So that's on Monday and Tuesday tonight and tomorrow night, okay. and uh, it'll be a wonderful time as well. All right. What time do you begin there? 7 p.m. we begin. And, of course, if they didn't win the prize, they can always look at our address at the end of the program and get their own copy uh, by writing to our office here in Tennessee. You had so many books. When I went down there, books and tapes and things they can get, audio and video, that I thought were incredible books that you just don't see all Yeah, the well, it's taken us a long time to track them down. I'm really pleased that there have been many Christians all around the world who are getting a burden to put the truth back in history. Books like uh, that one, Susan. Oh, yes, Isaac Newton. Uh -huh. Did you catch the uh, eclipse last Sunday night? Uh, I mean, I had to smile. Only in the news. Only in the I news, yeah. Well, it was on the no. front page of the USA Today last week, and it said, you know, at 11.40 p.m. Eastern Time on Sunday night, there will be an eclipse of the moon. And it went on. Um, in fact, on the Friday, you could have um, gambled as to whether it was or wasn't going to occur, but you would have lost if you said it wasn't, because these eclipses are so predictable and it finished off with, the, they said, next one will be in such and such 1996. Now, here we are. We live in a world which all the kids are being told the universe evolved by accident. And right there on the front page of USA Today is all the evidence that God has put laws into the creation. And yes. the book that you're looking at, Isaac Newton, he's the man that gave us the very foundational basics for our modern astronomy and our space travel. And he got it out of Jeremiah where God said, if you can break the ordinances, the laws that mm -hmm. I've put in creation, mm -hmm. then I will not send a redeemer, a son of David, to save Israel. And the fact is God has sent Jesus Christ, therefore he's never broken his laws, and you can't and I can't. If people mm -hmm. think they can, just try breaking the law of gravity. You can jump out of an airplane as many times as you like, and the law of gravity will break you because it's a reminder that God's laws can't be broken, physical or moral. They, they are can't, predictable. They are predictable and they can't be broken. And so we try and encourage people. All of these books are written for lay people because let's face it, that's what most of us are at heart. Yeah. We like to read it in nice, simple words and the real facts. And books like that are great for young people 
to put the truth back into the history. We got to the moon because the Bible is right. That's why Genesis was the first book read on the moon and all Americans need to know it. Okay. You, you are going to be able to answer just so many questions for these people in Franklin and Gallatin Well, Gallatin we always have a week. question time at the end because, you know, I just can't cover everything. There's no, just so much. And no. they, they're free to ask me any question they like. So if they didn't know who Cain married, if he wasn't able, they can bring up questions like that and we have a fun time. Okay. I'm going to push it just a little bit here with, uh, they're telling me it's time to go. But I want to ask one simple question and that is, if we all came from Adam, why do we look so different? We all come from Adam, why do we look so different? Of course, if they got the Origin of Races video, they'd find out what colour the first man was. That's right. But in terms of seeing where our different colours come from, number one, it doesn't relate to our environment. We didn't go black or white because of where we lived. The darkest people in the world are the little pygmies in Africa who live in the middle of the jungles where they don't need to be black to protect themselves from sun. There isn't any. When you have a look at our skin colours, since we've shifted white people from Europe to Australia, which is very hot, they haven't gone black. They've just gone pinker because they're now sunburnt. So our, we, we don't get our skin colour from the environment. If you look back through history, what you'll find, well, in fact, in one of our videos, The History of Man, we've got a picture of a Caribbean couple. Both of them are middle brown in colour. They hit the headlines because they had a set of twins. One twin was as black as the darkest night. The other was as white as the driven snow. All that happened was that one kid inherited more melanin than the other one, and the other kid got less. Melanin is the stuff that makes you brown. The more of it you've got, the darker you are. The less of it you've got, the lighter you are. So by the time of Noah, Adam's good skin colour had begun to break down. Some people began to inherit too much. Others began to inherit too little. Just like some of us get too much fat. You know what I mean? <laughs> and some no. of us don't get it. You know it. Oh, well, some people no. do, I'm sure. And, uh, and, and it shows up in terms of shape. Well, melanin shows up in terms of colour. And yeah. so you can trace it back, particularly to the Tower of Babel, when we were split up. And depending on the colour of your father there, what was the colour of your tribe? But it's all in the origin of the races and the history of man. All right. John McKay, thank you so thank you, much. Well, I wish you were going to be around a whole lot longer because we'd just get you back and uh, just find out why it's not just color, but it's shape of faces. And